Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end as we will hold a 30-minute networking session in the neural network. Here you can meet, ask questions to our distinguished speakers, connect, and chat with the AI for Good community. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. He Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from me as well. I'm Guillaume Martinez Rora from the ITU, and I would like to welcome you all for joining today's AI for Good webinar on wind industry, green energy robots for achieving the planet net zero future. This session is part of the AI for Good programming track where we discuss the role of AI power robots in achieving the UN SDGs. We have a distinguished set of panelists today, but as always, we are counting on you, the participants, to help create a very interactive session. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our great moderator today. His name is Stuart Mullin, and he is the Chief Operating Officer at the Global Wind Energy Council. A steward, welcome, and the show is all yours. Thank you very much, Gillen, and welcome everybody. Good afternoon from a wet and windy Denmark. As Gillen said, my name is Stuart Mullen, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Global Wind Energy Council. And I wanted to wish you a warm welcome from wherever you are in the world today to what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion in the role of AI and robotics in the wind industry. I'm particularly keen to hear from our panelists today on how this field will help us progress UN SDG 7 for affordable clean energy and UN SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. Last year, both the International Energy Agency, the IEA, and the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, articulated in their 2050 roadmaps that the exponential scale up of wind power will be a cornerstone for achieving a net zero world. If we're gonna meet this target, we have to quadruple the annual installations of wind turbines. If we continue at our current rate of deployment, we'll only reach 43% of wind energy capacity we need. That means we have to move beyond a business as usual approach and adopt a climate emergency approach to energy. We need to look for new ideas and technologies that can help us unlock the potential of wind power. And I believe that advancements in the field of AI and robotics can help us achieve those aims. I've personally been working in the wind industry for the past 15 years. During that time, I've worked for a couple of the world's leading wind turbine manufacturers, and I've had the privilege to visit both on and offshore wind parks during installation and operation. I've seen the craftsmanship of blade manufacturing, the precision of the just-in-time assembly lines for nacelle productions, and the NASA light -like control center that's, that monitor turbine performance. I'm very interested to hear from our panelists today on how AI and robotics can impact all of these areas. And if I may make one final remark before I introduce the first of today's presenters, I'm very much looking forward to hearing how robotics and AI can play a role in minimizing the health and safety risk for the industry. Anyone who's ever climbed a wind turbine or been involved in their manufacturing, installation and operation will realise just how dangerous a place a wind turbine can be. Working on a wind turbine, whether it's onshore or offshore, is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Technicians are working at heights, they're working with high voltage electricity, they're working in confined spaces and particularly with the older models. The turbines are being installed in the windiest places on earth. And when you go offshore, you can just add getting to the turbine as a major challenge, and not to mention an expense. Anything technology can bring to the table to help reduce health and safety risk for our industry is most welcome. In the future, with an expanding number of more powerful wind turbines being located hundreds of miles offshore or in hazardous areas, intelligent robots will be needed to make increasingly complex, expensive and dangerous operations viable, affordable, and safer with minimal environmental impact. 
Today's webinar, as Gillian said, we've assembled a diverse range of experts in the field, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today. But again, as a reminder, just to please use, if you have any questions, we'll be having a Q&A session at the end. So please use the uh, live video wall feature from the neural network. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Andrew McDonald, the Director of Offshore Wind Development and Operations at ORE, or Offshore Renewable Energy, Catapult. Building collaborative projects between ORE Catapult, industry and academic research partners is Andrew's core strength and is central to the value that ORE Catapult adds to the renewable sector. Andrew has led the development of joint industry projects that bring operators together to address sector-wide issues that need a coordinated approach. Andrew has also worked in the tidal energy sector and he has hands-on experience of project development and supply chain optimization. He has cross-sector innovation expertise, having worked on the development and introduction of new technologies across telecoms, IT and energies. Welcome, Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stuart, and delighted to be here. So um, look, really looking forward to a really interesting panel a session. It's, uh, it's a subject that's really close to my heart, and uh, we're very excited to be working on this area. So as, as Stuart says, my name is Andy McDonald. I work for the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. I'm the Director of Development, a Offshore Wind Development and Operations. And more and more, we're seeing robotics and AI as cornerstones of a innovation going forward. A, I've got a a few slides to share, um, really just setting the scene because the, uh, we've got a fantastic panel and, and there's some real a, uh, detailed domain expertise um, who will go into more detail. But I'd really like to try and give you an, an overview and, and set the scene uh, in terms of uh, the bigger picture. So for me, just a, if I can just find the slides there, and we'll start with these. Is that hopefully that is working? It looks like it. That's great. Thank you. So, as I say, Andy McDonald from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Um, what I what I want to talk about today is uh, really just why offshore wind is growing so rapidly, and why it's, it's such an important market, um, particularly in, in in light of the clean energy a challenge and the, the net zero challenge. Um, but I'd like to then drill down into a few areas where, where I think that we're seeing uh, robotics and AI becoming more and more important. So I'd like to go through kind of surveys, manufacture installation, a o and m and then really look at uh, some of the next steps forward. And, and that will hopefully lead on to uh, uh, the other speakers in terms of answering some of those questions. So looking forward to, to that. Um, in terms of the sector, the, the sector has grown incredibly rapidly over the last 10 years. And, and Partly that's to do with technology and technology moving things forward. And a lot of it's to do with, with size. So really just to give you an idea that the scale of, of offshore wind turbines, many of you will have seen onshore wind turbines, offshore wind turbines, very similar, um, but, but a lot bigger and, and getting bigger. And so we're looking at uh, blade length sizes of over 100 meters uh, now. Um, so we're looking at tip heights approaching 300 meters a overall. So these are very, very large uh, structures indeed. But the benefit of that is that that's driving cost reduction because each, each unit can produce more output uh, for the same capital expense going, going into it. So, so the size is really driving. There's improvements in efficiencies, there's improvements in O&M, which are also driving costs down. Um, but we've seen significant cost reduction over the last uh, 10 years. Um, the, the graph there is really just showing uh, particularly for the UK's uh, cost reduction, the blue line is showing the cost reduction over the last uh, uh, 10 years um, against the wholesale price, which is the red line. And what you're seeing is as we approach 25, uh, in terms of installed capacity, we're very much uh, on par with wholesale prices. What we're also seeing is the next generation of turbines will, will be floating offshore wind turbines as opposed to fixed bottom turbines, which are actually uh, embedded into the seabed, those will become cost competitive just after 2030. And that's a really exciting area, because what that means is the offshore wind can be deployed, not just in areas where there's 30 to 40, 50 meters of uh, uh, seabed, 
Uh, they can be deployed in areas with much deeper seabed and in similar way to oil and gas uh, platforms can be installed in, in deeper waters. So that really opens up a global market. Um, and the, the, it is very much a global market. The UK has led the way in terms of installed capacity. Um, that's now been overtaken by, by China in terms of its installation. And we're seeing these, these numbers in the bottom chart here. These are annual growth figures. Um, and and it's really showing that you know that each year we're putting more and more a uh, capacity in there, and that's driven by those those cost reductions that we've seen. China becoming a huge market, uh, really overtaking everywhere else this year or last year, um, but continuing to grow. But there's also markets opening up uh, in North America as well as across across Europe. So it's a huge growth market if you're looking for opportunities for where robotics can be uh, applied. Um, I wanted to take you through kind of four areas where I think there's some really good examples of a uh, where robotics can be applied. And first is really just to think about the challenge, the spatial challenge of identifying sites and building out sites a, for offshore wind. And when we look at site development, there's about 70 layers of data. So that takes you everything from the geotech and the geophys. So actually in the seabed, a, understanding what's in there so that we can understand what foundations need to go there through the water column, understanding the, the tidal environment, sediment movement, um, but then also the environmental impacts in terms of a, uh, marine mammals, in terms of uh, fisheries as well. So there's all those different spatial layers of data that need to be built in. Um, and you're covering extremely large areas of, of seabed because the spacing between the turbines is, is much larger than it is onshore turbines because they're, they're bigger turbines. So for example, the Scott Wind Leasing Round, which has just been announced just for the next generation of, of uh, uh, wind projects around Scotland, has something like 7,000 square kilometres of, of seabed that will need to be surveyed in the next couple of years. Um, and that survey work takes place over two to four years. So it's, it's a long period pulling together all of those different areas. And so what you're really looking at there is looking at how we can incorporate a uh, autonomous surface vessels in terms of doing those doing those surveys as, as well as uh, a subsea robotics to actually look at what's in the seabed. So huge opportunities in terms of improving and speeding up that, that data gathering. And I think, you know, very much the, the uh, uh, net zero challenges that we're looking at are, are pushing forward the speed that we need to do this as well. So it's not just about the quantity of data, there's a need to increase the speed. And I think robotics and autonomous systems in particular have a real strong role to play, play in this area. Um, the, the second area, which is probably less touched on uh, generally when, when we're looking at robotics is, is around manufacture. Hey, I've got a picture here. This is a, a, a relatively small uh, blade. It's about an 80 meter blade as opposed to the 100 meter plus blades. Um, but it's showing it's, it's still a relatively manual a process. And there's real opportunities for robotics not just in terms of the composite layout that we're seeing here, but also in terms of the coatings eh, that go on the outside of the, the blade. But these are, these are large structures, they're 20, 30, 40 tonne structures. Um, and when you consider there's two sides to a blade in, in the standard way of manufacturing, we need to look at the robotics for actually pulling together the two sides as shown in the, the picture here. Um, there's a company, DF, DFS Composites, uh, that manufacture this kind of tooling. Um, very sophisticated, highly accurate in terms of needing to, to pull this together. So robotics within the manufacture, um, hugely important. We have the same challenges around, for example, a welding a, of tower structures and some of the other substructures. So being able to reduce costs a, and improve the throughput of manufacturing is an area where we probably don't specifically think of offshore wind as a target market for robotics. But, but there's some incredibly important areas if we need a, to continue the growth at the same, at the same speed. Um, the third area I was wanting to look at really, and again, is, is probably slightly overlooked, is the installation side. Um, so this is a jack-up vessel, a, which has just been uh, loaded up with the equipment for uh, the installation of the, the East Anglia a one wind farm. Um, and it, it kind of just shows the, the intensity of the technology um, that's going out there. So this is a jack-up vessel. Uh, once it goes out to sea and into location, uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, the vessel body will be will be jacked up, or the the uh, the jacks, the large brown pillars, will be lowered down to give it a firm position on the seabed in order to install uh, the foundations and the turbines uh, on top of that out at sea. Um, but these vessels are incredibly expensive, so these are hundreds of thousands of pounds a day. Um, so the need to be able to install efficiently and, and quickly and safely um, is, is absolutely paramount in terms of keeping those, those costs down. And when you're looking at robotics, A, you're looking at heavy lift techniques, but you're also looking at other alternate ways of installing turbines. So this is a, a technology, an example from a company called SenseWind, A, who uh, have a, a concept and a demonstration of actually running the turbine up the tower and then tipping it over at the top in order to, to reduce costs and improve efficiency. So, so those kinds of fairly advanced robotics are an incredibly important a, a area for the, for the future of the sector. Um, as, a, as a kind of final area, and I know that my, the, the other speakers uh, on the panel will, will go into this in more detail, O&M is an obvious area, so operations and maintenance. Um, accessing turbines far out at sea, as Stuart points out, um, is, it is a hazard envir hazardous environment. It is difficult to get to, and it's an expensive area to do work. So using a, uh, a rope technicians to uh, actually inspect blades is incredibly expensive. And uh, a, a Shweta will, will cover that more from a sky specs a perspective. What we need to look at is can we, can we also do an inspection, but can we also look at doing repairs as well? And so from a catapult perspective, we've been working with a company, Bladebug, who have a crawler which can actually crawl along the blades and and start to look at doing a maintenance as well as, as inspection type activities. Um, and then it, you really want to start combining those different robotics approaches and saying, can you use autonomous surface vessels to actually take a autonomous uh, crawlers out and put them onto the blades to do that? So more and more we're starting to layer robotics uh, solutions on on top of each other. Um, but the same applies not just to blades and defects on blades, but also to towers and subsea structures as well. So there's, there's a huge variety of areas where getting robotic solutions uh, can reduce costs and, and increase, uh, increase safety uh, out at sea. Um, I'll go through a, a couple of other quick examples. Um, those were the kind of main areas that I, that I really wanted to highlight. Um, I was talking about the, the subsea areas. We, we often overlook the fact that wind farms are more than just the turbines. There's thousands of kilometers of uh, uh, inter-array cables between the turbines, but also export cables going back from substations back to shore. Those need to be buried in the first instance, um, but they also then need to be inspected to make sure that they're, they're performing correctly and there aren't any defects. The cable failures is a significant problem. Uh, for the sector in terms of cost, because that's that's how the power is taken back to shore. So, getting that right and ensuring that we're we're confident in the performance of the cables is, is hugely hugely important. Um, so this was an example of Rovcore, a company who who develop ROVs for for the inspection uh, of uh, cables and other uh, subsea items. Um, I was talking about kind of combining some of the technologies together. Uh, this is a project we we did with with Talis, um, looking at can we uh, put drones on the back of autonomous systems um, so that we're not just having the autonomous drones, but we're also having the autonomous vessels combined a, to, to uh, save costs even further? Um, when we look at um, the, the challenges of autonomous systems and robotics out at sea, the, the two big challenges are always around data collection and uh, power. A, and this is a project that we, we looked at with a company called Modus. A looking at providing power <coughs> offshore, so actually having kind of plug-in charge points for the uh, autonomous uh, underwater uh, uh, vessels um, so that they could recharge at sea and continue to do their work uh, in the correct, whenever the window of opportunity in terms of weather uh, conditions uh, open. So power is a hugely important uh, area. Uh, the robotics can't work, can't be autonomous unless it has access to power as well. Um, in terms of uh, the health and safety point, I mean, Stuart was was very rightly pointing out a uh, how it's the the number one priority uh, for the sector working offshore, um, and and again, robotics and AI have a huge place to play in terms of resolving some of those. So this is uh, an example of a design from a company Zellum, 
pay for an autonomous uh, search and recovery vessel. And it's designed to use AI to uh, identify and spot a potential casualties in the sea. Um, and then it has a, a robotic system, a conveyor belt system for bringing a, uh, casualties on board to a safe place until a, until, uh, a manned craft is available uh, to, to reach them. So again, huge focus on health and safety in terms of the work that we're doing. Um, and the final one is, 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 from some perspective, slightly more mundane, but bolts are a huge part of, of wind terms. There are thousands of bolts um, that need to be uh, checked and, and to ensure that their torque uh, is uh, at the correct level. Um, that's a hugely time-consuming process. Um, so there's, there's robotics that have a potential both for the monitoring, but also a, of the uh, retorquing of bolts. Uh, as required to, to maintain them. And, and that would have a huge cost saving uh, and also, again, a health and safety saving as well. So there's there's a wide variety of areas where uh, robotics can, can be applied. Um, I'd like to just say, finally, there's there's a couple of reports that a uh, Catapult has done under the, the banner of the Offshore Wind Innovation Hub, um, which provide a huge amount of detail um, into some of these. So the one is looking at the cost drivers to really understand what the costs are. And the second is, is looking at um, the impact of different a uh, robotic solutions. So those are those are probably worth worth a read if you're interested. Um, main focus and, and areas of interest are about design and capability. Um, so as capabilities improve, how can we apply them in different areas? The autonomy, I've spoken about um, a bit in terms of reducing the need for technicians to be offshore. Um, BVLOS, apologies for the acronym, that said beyond visual line of sight. And that's really, it's, it's partly about the regulations of operating drones um, out of sight and ensuring that we can do that, that safely. Um, we need to look at the turbine design to make sure that turbines are being designed so that robots can uh, access them and use them as efficiently. And then throughout you know, the industry, as with every other industry, you know, ensuring that these are connected, digitization and, and the comms piece that I talked about earlier uh, is important. And finally, adoption is, is hugely important. Um, I think there's still across robotics, people always have some hesitancy about change and use of robotics and the test and validation to ensure particularly autonomous systems uh, are operating is, is an area that's, that's uh, really important. How do you test systems uh, when you don't know necessarily the constraints that they're running under. Um, and I think that's that's an area that we'll see more and more interest in as robots become more sophisticated uh, as well. So that's really the summary. Hopefully that, that provides you with a kind of overview of potential applications for robotics uh, within offshore wind. Um, I'll be joining the, the, the panel at the end. If you've got questions, do, do keep putting them into the chat and uh, we'll take it from there. So thank you for the opportunity and uh, we'll, we'll speak during the panel session. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. Uh, very, uh, an excellent presentation. And I really love some of the uh, examples that you bring to the fore there, in particularly the use of robotics in manufacturing. Uh, and plus all of, you know, that robotics can also be used for some of the main mundane tasks. And I really like the idea of actually thinking about robotics into uh, the turbine design. I mean, I know from you know, my experience with the manufacturers that it takes some time to get you know, turbine design changes through the whole process. Uh, so, I mean, we, we need to start thinking this in now. And I know that a lot of our OEMs are already starting to look at that. Um, it now gives me great pleasure to welcome our second speaker for today, Ms. Sweeta Kushu, Engineer Man Engineering Manager, Computer Vision at SkySpecs. Sweeta is a senior engineer and lead of the inspection vision team at SkySpecs. She received her MS degree in ECE from the University of Michigan in 2016 with a specialization in machine learning and image processing. She's passionate about solving the real world problems that are challenging humankind using artificial intelligence, especially computer vision. Application of these techniques, techniques in the wind space has been her primary focus at work. She's also one of the 15 participants of the 2021 Women in Wind Global Leadership Program organized by my organization, the Global Wind Energy Council, in partnership with Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition, or GWNet. 
Additionally, she volunteers with Climate Mind, a nonprofit organization building a web application designed to make conversation about climate change easier. Welcome, Sweeta. The floor is yours. Thank you, Stuart, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. As Stuart introduced me, I'm Shweta Kushu, and I, I'm, I work on, with the computer vision inspection team at SkySpecs. So uh, driving right down into it, uh, let me quickly share my screen. All right. So, so Andrew already gave a great overview of how robotics can play an important role in the advancement of wind space. So I'm going to focus a little more on the wind operation and maintenance industry. And with the help of real examples, try and talk through how we can leverage uh, robotics and AI in this space particularly. Uh, and to start that with, I would like to spend maybe just a minute or so in answering why we even care about O&M and wind turbine maintenance and why we are talking about this. So in this transition from the fossil fuels to renewable energy as a means to combat climate change and essentially answer the uh, UN Sustainable De Development Goal 13 for combat combating climate change, uh, wind is expected to be a prominent source of energy by 2050. This means that the wind energy needs to scale up and this also and that is already happening as we see in the trends, there's already an increased capacity throughout the world. Uh, but along with increased installation and capacity, uh, competitive cost of producing wind energy is actually vital to scale the industry and make wind power cheaper and more accessible. The health and lifespan of a wind turbine is a very important factor in this cost of energy production of the asset over its lifetime. So as operators today are already dealing with aging assets, uh, O&M accounts for actually a good chunk of this cost of energy. And the problem is that, and so it becomes really important to talk about uh, wind operation and maintenance reduces cost of energy. And currently the problem is that the renewable energy companies so far have kind of lacked those critical tools and infrastructure needed to manage their wind assets and help optimize these O&M costs. So this is where like companies like SkySpecs, we come into picture, we, we try and work with the wind companies and help develop these critical tools. Uh, this is like a big overview of uh, the suite of products and solutions that uh, we can use do to design that we have designed to help uh, um, make this uh, feel uh, this uh, help optimize uh, the wind ONM. Um, but for the rest of this presentation, I'm mainly going to focus on the inspection inspections aspect of it and talk about with the help of real examples of how robotics and AI help. Uh, uh, inspect the wind turbines, uh, of how we can use robotics and AI in, uh, to help uh, optimize inspection space. I do want to say that uh, the application of AI is not only restricted to this part. Uh, in fact, it plays a vital role in uh, condition and monitoring systems and can really help uh, do some really smart predictions to optimize uh, and uh, predict the future, uh, the health of the wind turbine for, through condition monitoring systems. But for this short presentation, I'm only going to focus on inspections. Uh, so the wind turbine blade is actually a very crucial part of uh, this conversation because for, for, of wind turbine management because it is a leading cause of turbine failure. And unlike drivetrain, there aren't actually any sensors on the blade that can continuously project our, and project the health information of the blade. So it is important to monitor the structural damages and it, so that they're caught on time and so that the repairs can be made timely before the damage leads to significant degradation or, and ultimately cause turbine failure. Um, this year, we've already seen this in Andrew's presentation, best example of the traditional approach of inspecting uh, turbine blades and it involves a technician climbing up the blade and inspecting it while hanging from ropes. Um, needless to say, this is a very slow, expensive and quite a bit unsafe process. And fun fact that uh, this is actually a picture of one of my co-workers uh, who's been in the wind industry for a very long time and is now a blade expert on our team. So. This kind of use case is actually perfect for a drone-based application. And uh, this is where uh, our autonomous drone inspection uh, service comes into picture. Um, our, the drone basically takes off from a touch of a button. 
maps the turbine and the surroundings using this mounted LIDAR de device on it. And it is able to navigate itself around the turbine using this mapping information. Uh, and while it's trying to maintain a safe distance, it clicks pictures while ensuring complete coverage of all the sides of all the blades, and then on completion, lands safely back to where it took where it took off from. This process is obviously faster, cheaper, and much more safer than traditional uh, inspections. Uh, it is also repeatable since it is completely autonomous and it doesn't require human input, except maybe in the case of emergency landings. Uh, here is another video of just how the drone is taking pictures as it is moving along the blade. Uh, these are the pictures that we and the customer use to assess uh, the health of the blade. Uh, the benefit of having this quick and cheap solution is that now the operators can actually budget regular inspections in their blade management plans, which was not so much feasible with the traditional methods of inspection. So yeah, this is just an example of that. I'll go on to the next slide. So I, I wanted to put together uh, of some of these numbers to illustrate the impact of having drone-based technology and what it enables. We are today monitoring a huge portion, portion of turbines worldwide and have accumulated a lot of data for the customers. Uh, the drone-based inspection is just takes an average of, of about 15 minutes per turbine and it's six times faster than even leading ground-based inspection cam camera inspection systems and obviously so much faster than having to uh, climb, having a technician climb the turbine to, uh, in the traditional rope climbing method. Uh, and another key benefit that I want to highlight of using this kind of technology is this. Uh, the LiDAR data fused with the image sensor data allows us to use the camera projection and geometry uh, to get this, uh, to automatically stitch together these pictures and get this really nice comprehensive view of the blade. And it allows you to look at the entire span of the blade at the, in, in one sitting. Uh, it also allows us to do something very important, which is translation of the coordinates from the picture frame to the wolf uh, frame and get details like the distance of, distance of damage from the root of the turbine, the size and shape of the damage. And this is absolutely vital information when we're assessing the health and severity of the damages on the blade. And it also helps to understand how damages are propagating um, year over year throughout the lifespan of the blade and helps make repair decisions and prioritize and budget for repairs. Uh, so we talked about external blade inspections. Now, internal components within the blade can also develop damage and sometimes only after significant growth are they visible from the outside. So it really becomes important to talk about internal blade inspections as well. Traditionally, this was, again, a very challenging process that involved technicians crawling inside the blade to inspect it. Uh, this required special training is definitely a bit unsafe. And even so, humans are only allowed to go up to a certain point inside the blade. So using a small robotic car, like the example picture I have on the right, simplifies this process considerably in terms of cost, time, safety, and a small rover, like the SkySpex rover picture here, can travel so much further than a human can um, and take uh, inspection pictures. Slide. Um, the rover is fitted with five cameras uh, that can take pictures from all sides and then get, hence again gets a comprehensive picture of the inside of the plate and ensuring full coverage. And these pictures are then again used to identify damages uh, that can be seen from inside of the blade. And the data from both this external, the, both the external and the internal inspections can give a complete picture of the damages of the blade and can get insights like whether the damage originates from the inside or the outside, what the actual severity of the damage is and helps wind farm owners know just how, to, how the repairs should proceed. It's also a very important aspect of the uh, blade inspection um, profile. So once we have gathered now all this inspection data, the images are then analyzed for damages so that again, our stakeholders can make better data-driven decisions on blade repairs. Manual visual analysis of the pictures requires usually like a multiple quality control stages. And it's, it is a very subjective 
uh, identification and categorization of damages uh, on the blade images. And this kind of a process can again benefit a lot from automation and deployment of AI techniques. Uh, because this is like a classic AI problem, automating something that humans are doing repeatedly. Uh, this is actually what my team focuses on at Sky, in SkySpecs. Um, and our goal with these machine learning systems is to gradually reduce the human dependency without adding improper expectations or the unexpected bias from the machine learning algorithms. And I'm just going to highlight a few projects that we are working on in this space. Uh, so once the inspection data has been ingested, the, traditionally there is a manual process where a human goes through every picture and marks all the damages on them. Now, the thing is that humans are really good at new creative ideas, but we are not as adept when we have to work with repetitive tasks that require focus attention. So you can always, um, so you can often see human errors in the form of like missing damages or misclassifications of damages. Uh, so we, to help assist that, we built this uh, automated damage detection system that has been trained to spot damages in blade pictures. And it's, and as you can see, it works on all sorts of different backgrounds with, and all sorts of different textures of images. Um, and this does it does all of that within a fraction of a second, which is much faster than what it take a human analyst to go through the pictures. Um, in these examples here, the green box was what was drawn by the human analyst. The red box and the little segmentation, like the little mask inside that is what the uh, AI system was able to detect. And it does a pretty decent job in detecting damages. Um, here's a video of our system production where we are, where, where the AI generates, uh, sorry, where the AI generated damages act as a seed to the human analysis process. So it speeds up their time and also helps reduce the potential misses due to oversight. And I like to think of this more as an like an advanced driving assistance system which is supporting the human annotation process like we have in uh, automated driving systems. Uh, it is uh, it has since contributed to uh, some increase in the speed of analysis and some reduction in the damages being missed without actually compromising on any quality and interpretability of the results, which is usually often a concern with machine learning systems. Uh, then. This is another project that we are working on. Um, the damages that get identified then need to be classified into several categories. And honestly, this is a very difficult task to perform consistently, consistently given the close nature of the various damage types. And one such issue that we come across constantly is distinguish between, distinguishing between cracks and these other types of damages that resemble cracks. Uh, it is actually very crucial to mark cracks appropriately because mislabeling them uh, to other types can sometimes greatly underestimate the actual severity of the damage. And if such damages get overlooked, they can eventually even lead to se severe degradation of the blade. So it's important to catch those early in the process. So we use the machine learning model for automated classification that acts like an auditing step after a human analyst has identified the damage type. So if there's a discrepancy between the human categorization and what the model thinks it is, it is flagged during our quality check process and it shows up uh, for a human to review. So in these cases, you can see the ones that are flagged as red um, is what the human, it's like the model telling the human and you need to go and review this and make sure this is actually mapped correctly. So this model is actually able to perform better on ambiguous cases than trained blade experts and it can help catch mistakes early on. And we have found out that a large percentage of the changes in our final quality check stage are now actually prompted by the model. So it is extremely beneficial to have that. Just another last project that I'm going to highlight is the damage segmentation one, where the, where the purpose is to accurately identify the actual contours of the damage within a human or a machine drawn bounding box. And this has a lot of uh, use cases. It helps with precise calculation of the shape and size of the damage. It has so many benefits, like better estimating the actual severity of the damage, helping link the damages over time and helping understand how it propagates over time. And uh, this drawing of a mask is much more cumbersome for a human to do than it is for a machine. So it's again, a great application of AI in this space. So wrapping up, I gave an, uh, a, an overview, a very quick overview of the robotics and AI work that we do in the wind space. And just to wrap that up, it's important to know that the, 
the transition from green energy towards a sustainable future is, uh, is going to require wind to be at the heart of that transition. And using technologies like robotics and AIs to run and operate the wind farms is gonna really help lower that cost of energy. And then eventually it's gonna make clean energy cheaper and accessible to all and really help achieve those 2015 net zero emission goals. Um, just a few links that if anybody's interested to read more about either sky specs or just about the wind energy in general, I think these are a few um, good sources. And yeah, that was all from my presentation. And I'm looking forward to the panel discussions later and answering some of the questions you have for me. Thank you. Back to you, Stuart. Thank you very much, Trader. That was a uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, I've actually seen a lot of, uh, during the manufacturing process, process of blades, I've seen sort of quality inspectors and also during blade inspections going out and tapping blades and, and listening to blades and looking at damage and assessing these. I mean, seeing how that you guys have automated the collection of that data and also the, of the efficiency in which you uh, process the data, I think it's really fascinating and it's going to be a, uh, an awesome, uh, I guess, automation for the industry. And if we, this particularly, if this, uh, technology can be rolled out at scale, which is what we're going to need to drive to be able to, as you say, realize the, the energy transition. Thank you very much for that. Uh, now, it's now time for our penultimate speaker of the day, Dr. Elizabeth Traeger. Dr. Traeger is a senior researcher at DNV. She's been working in renewables uh, for over a decade, starting her career in technical engineering advisory services and transitioning into research. She explores emerging digital technologies, the integration of, the, of such novel technologies in industrial applications, and the assurance of such solutions. Her passion is technology transfer. Dr. Traeger's current research concerns advanced time series statistics, the development of autonomous UAVs for remote inspection of industrial assets in extreme environments, verification of image processing algorithms used in inspection, machine learning, and predictive analytics on large data sets within the energy domain. She works to integrate the latest advancements in artificial intelligence and robotics into renewable energy project operations and maintenance. She continues to work on wind project development, operational assessment, due diligence, and grid integration projects worldwide. Dr. Traeger holds a PhD and MSc from the University of Oxford in the UK, in the field of statistics and a BS in mathematics uh, from the University of Kansas in the US. Welcome, Dr. Traeger. Thank you, Stuart. And thank you to the two previous speakers for setting the stage for me to jump in now that our audience is so well informed. I sit in an interesting position. So I work for DNV, and I feel that our audience may not necessarily know who DNV is. DNV is an independent assurance and risk management company, and we do not just play in the energy realm. We play in ship and offshore. We look at management systems and software platforms and digital solutions. We're worldwide with thousands of employees, one of which is me. What we do, is manage risk and complexity with confidence. So we sit in between the people making technology and the people using technology. So we certify new processes and technology coming on the market. We assure that it's meeting quality standards. We advise clients on what to use and what's the best choice for their particular problem. And we create the rules and standards which all need to uphold to make sure that we do meet our energy transition goals and ensure a safe working environment. And with that, our purpose is to safeguard life, property, and the environment. And we do that to be a trusted voice. So we really are a third party independent outside opinion looking on both sides of the this screen. Now, in that very long introduction, Stuart mentioned that um, I've worn both hats. I've worked on the energy advisory side, so I've worked with clients and seen real problems. And I've also shifted into research. So DNV works with universities, new startups, and anyone who has exciting new technology. How do we get these wonderful new products into the field and into the hands of the people who need it most? 
And one of those new technologies a few years ago when I started in research was AI and robotics and advances. So in 2017, we had this wonderful vision of the future where to be safe, all humans would be taken out of the picture. We would have robotics deployed using autonomous systems from afar being monitored to do all that dirty work, all the inspection work, all of the hard maintenance, all of the construction and deconstruction and decommissioning of assets. I'm happy to say that now in 2022, as we've seen from our previous two speakers, some of that has come to place. We do have autonomous inspections above and below water. And we do have tools with artificial intelligence and computer vision to help us identify defects which need action going forward. How did we get here? How does industry take this on? Good question. Why haven't we gotten to full autonomy? I mean, this is the vision that DNB really wants to see is repeatable analysis where humans are really taken out of that safety context that puts us in risk of going future. And really we're talking extreme environments. And that key is trust and it's trust in the technology. You could say, I trust things that are standardized. And so we look to regulations, standards, and recommended practices. And there are many that govern this area and govern energy as a whole. But when we go to certify these things and to recommend something, there are several things that make it very difficult for industry to adopt all of these wonderful new tools. Um, one, we're working within a safety critical system. So everybody needs energy. It is a national grid connectivity. If that goes down or is it damaged in any way, there are major consequences, loss of life, high money damages could occur. So realizing that all of these wind energy assets are connected to this grid, there is extra scrutiny to anything that is used in that area. Another issue is many of these solutions are now very multidisciplinary. It's not just robotics. It's not just the material science that goes into the components. It's data engineering of the data that goes in. It's computer science of the programming that goes into the systems. There's cybersecurity. There's communications for working with these things. So in order to get into the standards, we have many different realms and areas that it falls under. The other thing which we have to deal with is jurisdictions. So when we talk about offshore, it will be offshore, depending on how close it is, there will be the country, so aviation authorities, localities, there's maritime authorities that have different jurisdictions, um, and also the grid system that it's going into will have a separate set of laws and jurisdictions. So there's a lots of layers of regulation which could make it really hard to get to. Another certification issue is the maturity to market. So many of these solutions come out of wonderful university research projects or startups who are quite keen to get into the market and sell their wares, but they don't have that sense of maturity and they aren't an established player. So it's really difficult for an industry to judge the longevity of these new players and what sort of impact they're going to make in the long term when we think about assets that have 20 to maybe extending 35 year lives. Um, another issue is all of these technologies are iterative by design. So the types of offerings and perhaps drones that are being used today will be upgraded and in two years time, it will be a different drone. The AI systems and machine learning algorithms that are utilized, they will be continuously updated. So anything that is certified in this point of time will not be the same thing that's being used in the future. And how does that land with certifications? And just the sheer pace of innovation. So standards and regulations take time to get consensus by all parties and to be put into practice. And by that time, something new has come on the market. And I think a real thing that needs special attention is the use of AI. And it's the use of AI that's a real interest to me personally. 
and it's something that DNV has been looking into to get going and to get adopted more because it really has great powers as we've seen from SkySpecs to find defects, to make things easier, faster, and better to crawl through all this additional data that we're generating. So DNV's position on trusting an AI is actually not that different from trusting a person. So we have principles of assurance methods that go towards a person or an organization, and AI can be treated exactly the same way with a few caveats. So in order to trust a person, we have to know the characteristics that we need in order to assume a position of high esteem. And for AI, there's about five different characteristics that we would like to see. Um, one is legitimacy. So is there quality data there? Is it suitable? You know, is it performing as it should? We want to know the actual abilities. Uh, what's gone into the testing? What's gone into the si simulation? Is there evidence that it is performing as it should? What is the human machine interdependency? So what level of autonomy and control is left to the machine? And how much is a human interacting? Where are the roles? who has the agency in the system, that's really key to define those and see where breakpoints could be. I mean, this is AI and robotics are tools for humans and they should be using them. And understanding those rules is really important in getting a good assurance. Um, we also need to know the purpose. Is it clearly defined disclosure of goals? And this comes into effect when we start collecting data and we decide that perhaps the data collected for one purpose, perhaps inspection to identify defects, could be used in another way, perhaps in a navigational system. You know, what are the benefits? How is that being used? And is it clear to all stakeholders how the data is being used? Um, and is it being monitored? So as I've said, this is an iterative nature and things change. Um, when we look at AI algorithms that are continuously updated, they can go down a path which may not be the intended path. So one has to have some sort of continuous monitoring in place and a plan once something has been identified as awry to correct. But given that all of those things are in place, we can just assi assign assurance framework. And so the whole idea is to, instead of buying a laundry list of regulations that someone has to go through, we need to look at the asset, how it works, and identify the stakeholders who might have a concern about some sort of risk. And so the whole point is to assess risk and mitigate it where it can. And this is for us, we feel this should be an iterative process and it should be modular. So there are cases when we look at, say, an autonomous surface festival. When you think of an autonomous car, you may be familiar with, but those ships that are going to perhaps an offshore wind farm, they can be autonomous as well. There are different stages in that component which have different parts of AI and they work with each other. So in designing a navigational system, there has been a simulation models put up. So that simulation model and component needs to be assured. In the navigational system, it's using computer vision to identify obstacles around. So that computer vision system needs to be assured separately to ensure that it doesn't run into anything. All the sensors that are, it's being used, cameras, LIDARs, radar, sonar, those two need to be assured. But all of those things which add into the whole navigational system can be assured and if something changes, the only part that has changed, perhaps an algorithm has been upgraded or a new camera has been added, that can be put in the system as a whole, assured and go forward and we can feel confident that it can be used in an industrial context. You know, this is available now and this is what is allowing folks such as SkySpecs and other vendors to get out there and give us real value. As we go from semi-autonomous, say a flight plan, to fully autonomous with remote, if the online visual site does happen in the near future, something that I do have concerns about and the industry is very concerned about is the cybersecurity challenge. So 
what we are starting to see is excitement about the Internet of Things and edge compute and local networks. So instead of having all of the data collected by a drone or a submersible and sent back for central processing, the idea here is that the onboard computers or at the actual farm can identify those defects and then just send an alert back to the central station saying this needs to be addressed, action is needed. Well, we're part of a connected system, as I said earlier, we're part of the national grid. And as we add more sensors, we need more communications and bandwidth. And we've unfortunately seen that uh, nation's energy security is an issue and it's a big target for hackers. So even the wind industry has suffered from cyber attacks. So ensuring that those systems are in place from the onset is really key. And I, I feel that Many times we get excited about the technology and what it can do, but we have to step back and see how it sits in the hole. How is the data being used? How will this be secure going forward? So security must be from the onset of design as is deployment. But given that, we can do it. So we know that there's risks such as cybersecurity. We know that there's risks of things going awry, but we can address it. You know, regulations do exist from authorities and they're coming swiftly, maybe not as fast as things change, but they're being made general enough to still apply good principles. We can use continuous assurance to always check to make sure that we're aware of issues and that we're addressing them and taking a holistic approach. I mean, AI and robotics isn't something that just sits in design labs or universities like we can use it now and it has so much potential to help us all to reach our goals. We're really excited in bringing that forward and addressing any needs as they come. So I really thank you for your time and I look forward to questions and meeting you all in the neural network afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Traga. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation. And again, having someone, having experienced uh, sort of uh, the installation and operations and maintenance of large offshore wind projects, I know that uh, a lot of the uh, guys with many, many years experience have that difficulty in uh, perhaps letting go and trusting in that AI stuff. So having that certification and, and verification and all of those strict procedures for AI that can hopefully build that trust and give give out give those people that have been doing these things for for decades. I really hope that this actually could lead to this. Well, perhaps not moving all of the human element, uh, but at least the at least uh, the bulk of the human element for these dangerous areas. So, thank you very much for that presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, it's almost time for our final speaker of the session, but before we move on, I just want to remind you that we're having uh, we're going to jump straight into the Q and A session at the conclusion of the presentation. So, make sure you have your questions ready. Um, and now to round out our uh, today's formal presentations, I'd like to introduce Professor Mirko Kovac. Professor Kovac is the Director of Aerial Robotics of the Aerial Robotics Laboratory, full professor at Imperial College London and Royal Society Wolfson Fellow. He is also heading the Materials and Technology Centre of the Robo of Robotics at the Swiss Federal Laboratories for Material Science and Technology in Zurich. His re research group focuses on the development of novel aerial robotics for distributed sensing and autonomous manufacturing in complex natural and man-made environment. Professor Kovac's particular specialization is in robot, robot design, hardware development, and multimodal robot mobility. Before his appointment in London, he was a postdoctoral researcher at Harvard University, and he obtained his PhD at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Swan. He received his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich in 2005. Since 2006, he has presented his work in more than 70 international proceedings and journals. He's won several best paper awards and has delivered over 30 keynote lectures. He also acts regularly as an advisor to government, investment funds and industry on robotic opportunities. Welcome, Professor Kovacs. 
Well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you everyone for being here. It's my great honor to be here alongside the speakers who have given such a great overview on the current uh, opportunities and the state of the art uh, that is uh, happening today with offshore wind. What I would like to ask in this presentation is the question of how we can think about the future. So what will happen in the next five to 10 years? And how can we build robots that will supply the technology for this uh, step change in the sector? And so three, three things I think we have seen from the presentation so far. This is number one, that robots are here to stay. So it's really, robotics is not going away. Offshore wind will be roboticized. The second one is also that offshore wind will become larger. So 300 meter large blades are, or um, turbines are really state of the art today. And number three, that they become more and more offshore, so far away from the coast, 100 kilometers maybe away from the coast. So we really need residential systems. So robots that will live on the turbine, do autonomous maintenance and repair tasks, and being remotely operated by the humans. And so I hope that this presentation can give a bit of some pointers of where the technology streams that are currently in academia can contribute to that. And this is exactly something that we can also learn from nature of how to build systems that are residential, that are operating with a high level of accuracy and robustness to environmental uncertainty that is encountered in the natural world. So if you look at these flying insects, for example, we see that they use interaction control, autonomous navigation, uh, aerodynamics that is very non-steady state, multimodal sensing, and they do this by integrating different materials, different structures, actuators, and sensors together. And what I would like to emphasize here is that they are not built in the same way as we build robots today. So, in fact, if you look at the way how they evolve and how they are growing and um, building their bodies and nervous systems, we see that it's really a co-evolution of structures, materials, sensory systems, actuation systems, aerodynamics and overall design of the animal. So this co-evolution, multidisciplinary co-evolution, if we want to call it like that, is really, I think, very key for the development of next generation of robots. So this synthesis approach of co-evolving the controller and the body, the brain and the body together and along the way is what we refer to as physical AI. And this physical AI, I believe, is the paradigm that needs to that can really support the development of such robots so let me give you an example so if for example we have a robot that wants to land on a blade on a wind turbine blade we can do this with a lot of sensing and control as you see on the right side so visual sensing and um, model predictive control for example however if you look at nature we see that also nature uses a lot of mechanical structures so antennas legs adaptive morphology to land and so this combination of physical and mechanical intelligence is what we need to fuse in order to make systems that are robust and that can rely on their body and their sensors um, to do this kind of landing maneuvers. And so one example that, it, that I quite like in nature is uh, the spider. And the spider is able to build structures and then move on that and use it as a sensor using local decision-making to build those structures. So one of our robots uh, or projects was the hypothesis that this type of methods can be used to stabilize robots in flight and like this allow them to do repair tasks. So let me explain. So for example, if you have a flying robot, it can do visual sensing using visual autonomy, but also it can attach itself and then perch in the same way as a spider would perch and to maintain and inspect the surface of the blade itself, as you see here in the video. So it attaches and by then perching, it can sustain itself, save precious flight energy and inspect the surface doing non-destructive evaluation, surface uh, manipulation, repair tasks, manufacturing tasks, sampling tasks, and so on. And so this has been proven to be quite a, a powerful approach to robot mobility. So perching instead of flying. So like this extending the, the operational time by a factor of 10 or a factor of 100 compared to the limited flight time that we have in today's robots. Similarly, we, we can see that this type of perching 
can allow it to um, also carry more payload because of this extended flight operation time. And also it can be more wind robust. So even if it's windy, it might be able to stabilize the robots in those windy environments. We can also see this, this tensile manufacturing, as you see in the video on the top right, can help to um, manufacture structures or repair elements and make uh, maybe even composites in air. And also coming back to the, to the body again, um, if you want to land on the blade, it really helps to have soft compliant morphologies that can absorb the impact on landing. And like this can uh, position the robot on the blade. So these are the type of examples of where we can look at the combination of the physical intelligence and the digital intelligence to enable next generation of physical interaction for operation in complex and unpredictable environments where offshore wind, of course, is an example uh, thereof. Now, the tensile element, of course, is, exactly, is also very important to complement human operation. And so I don't know about you, but I would be very scared when I, if I would be this person here. And of course, uh, the operators and technicians who do this type of work are very courageous and very trained and skilled to do this. But even then, it's a very dangerous task. Now, if I would be manager of this uh, wind farm, I would also be scared because if something happens, uh, then of course, uh, it would be terrible. So complementing this type of manual interaction with tactile flight, so robots that can physically engage uh, with the surface can really bring value and not just reduce the cost of the operation itself, but reduce the amount of downtime. So by improve, increasing the speed, it can reduce the downtime and like this provide enormous cost savings because the facility can keep on operating, keep on generating electricity, which of course is the main value of the asset. Now, if you want to land on the surface, and this is something I would like to emphasize, is that we can also there build on biological, biological principles of how to do that. So insects land on the surface by using optic flow-based navigation. Optic flow-based navigation is a form of using the uh, visual system and the expanding um, field on the retina to uh, estimate the distance to the object. So without going into too much detail here, basically what we see is that this um, is a uh, biological principles, and we have developed a method of using the fictitious obstacle hypothesis approach to that by using a Kalman filter that fuses various sensor readings. And then this allows the vehicle to use very little computation or onboard intelligence, so using only 20 grams of electronics and a small microcontroller, allowing it to autonomously fly in those type of constrained environments as you see here. So it's full onboard autonomy, on a vehicle of only 158 grams in weight, in mass. So it can be even less than 100 grams. And like this, it can navigate and go into enclosed environments which are really hard to access otherwise. And one of those environments, as was also mentioned before, is the insides of the blade. The insides of the blade is very key. And so we need very small systems that can autonomy, autonomously move there. And not just that, this type of intelligence, biological intelligence, can allow the vehicles to do tactile flight as well. So engaging with the surface by using very little computational tasks as you see in this video here. So like this potentially operating also while the facility is moving. So as the blade is, doesn't need to be shut down, it could potentially operate during the operation while managing this tactile interaction with the blade from the inside. So the, the last, the third topic that I would like to quickly touch upon is is the outside of the blade. And of course, if it's offshore, then um, the blade is very much challenged by the waves and the splash zone. And inspecting this splash zone, so the interface of the water, uh, takes a lot of time. And of course, going there by boats from turbine to turbine takes is very expensive and dangerous as well because of the waves there. So um, I think there's a big opportunity also in using robots for these air aquatic inspection tasks. And one example I would like to share here, which is a recent work that we have uh, tested in a lake and now are applying for offshore wind environments. And that's basically a flying vehicle that can move very fast to the blade itself and then use an underwater robot that would go there, navigate, manipulate and inspect the underwater or below uh, surface uh, infrastructure. 
And after that, the, blade, the vehicle can come back or fly to the next wind turbine blade. And like this, greatly reduce the downtime, increase operational efficiency of the inspection, reduce the time, and like this, um, bring value to the, to the assets. Actually, we are working on this field of aerial aquatic robots for about uh, nine years now. And so there are different platforms that can be used depending on the use case. But I think aerial aquatic transitions are really important for addressing the need for underwater inspection in offshore wind. There's also a book that will come out and that came out this month, uh, which explains some of the scientific principles and, and control systems and so on that can be employed in that. Now, this was a very broad and high level overview of some of, our, some of the work that we are doing, but also the community is addressing. And we are now uh, working with industrial partners to bring this to the market. So it's not some future um, uh, vision only, it's actually, uh, these, these are actually things that we can really apply today uh, with industrial use cases. Doing that, um, one of the important uh, aspects in that is also using uh, assets, so representative environments where we can test these type of robots. And one example of that is the EMPA flight arena in Switzerland, and we also have one in London, where we can test these type of robots and create wind turbine blades that are now erected into, into the space where we can test these robots and like this um, work on the artificial intelligence on the systems. So with this, I would like to thank uh, the funders. Um, many of which are really focused on uh, sustainability, offshore environments, offshore wind and so on, but also on manufacturing and also the European Union and Royal Society for the support in this. Uh, of course, I would also like to thank the team who are actually doing all the hard work on, on building these robots. And I would also like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, Professor Kovac. That was fantastic i mean to 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 show those videos and what you guys have been doing it's just amazing um look we have gone a little bit over time with our presentation so we will try to uh have our interactive q a now we'll kick that off straight away um i'd like to pose a question to the panelists uh starting with you dr traeger looking into your crystal ball what are the area of the wind industry that is not currently utilizing AI and robotics that could benefit most from adopting AI and robotics in the future? And I'll go to all of the panelists with that question. I'll take Dr. Traeger first. Um, the area where I see mainly AI making an impact where it's not is wind farm control. So we can use strategies of reinforcement learning on how to learn to best optimize the turbines, not just for power, we can look at wake steering, we can look to minimize fatigues and to more intelligently control the wind farm under different conditions. So I think that's an area that is very ripe and that needs more attention and has huge gains for energy fatigues and other benefits. And that could, involve additional sensor systems, but really it's the AI and the control systems and giving that autonomy to the actual turbines. Thanks for that. Professor Kovac, we'll jump back to you now. Thank you very much. It's a brilliant, brilliant and very important question. And I think one of the key that will happen in very near future is the integration of autonomous surface vessels, underwater vehicles, aerial vehicles, and the asset itself. So how can we think of the robots becoming the immune system of the asset? And I think this kind of self-maintaining um, self ecosystem of various robots that work together will be the key to address. And these interfaces between the different assets and controllers and so on is something that is missing, which I think will be very important going forward. Thanks for that. Uh, Andrew McDonald. I mean, I've got a long list. <laughs> if it was to pick one, I think it's it's really around the robotics and it's the move from inspection to maintenance and repair. And I think that's that's a really tough bit. And what, what we see at the moment is we see we're managing to do the inspection bit. And therefore, you know, in the example of blades, we're not using rope access technicians for that. But when we need to repair the blades, we still need to put somebody on the end of a rope and, and, uh, and enable them to do that. And I think that applies both subsea as well as aerial, as, as well as to, to sort of substructures. And I think that change is something that, that would really 
move things forward leaps and bounds to that and move from just doing the inspection and just just seeing what's happening actually changing changing it thank you very much Shweta Kushu uh, I'd like to hear from you now uh, thank you, Stuart, for the question. I mean, as Andrew said, the possibilities are endless because anywhere where you have repetitive processes, automation can be always employed in some capacity. And uh, Professor Kovac and Andrew already did a very good job in talking about the potential of robotics in this future. Um, and just to tag a little bit along that, I also foresee a lot of uh, value in maybe like edge device or autonomous robot installations at site, in, at site that provide like a continuous stream of information um, uh, for uh, about the turbine's uh, performance and health. I think one thing that I would like to add, uh, which I've seen uh, by working at SkySpecs that is very challenging, but will extremely benefit the industry is using all this data from these different sources to get this holistic picture about the turbine and using this multimodal data to make AI predictions on things like return of investment of turbine maintenance. So something like given the current health of the turbine, finding what is the optimal repair strategy that would minimize cost and maximize energy production. And right now we're trying to solve that with these different sources of data in isolation, but I think there's a lot of value to be gained of by doing some sort of holistic prediction by using this multimodal data set. So I see some sometime in the future, maybe this will become a reality. Yeah, thanks for that. And we'll stay with you now uh, for another question, if you don't mind. What are some of the best practices of applying robotics and AI to wind? And what, what's really worked that you've seen? Uh, yeah, that, I think that's a, a very good question, Stuart. And uh, I can speak for my team and what has worked for us when we are trying to apply AI techniques to solve business concerns. And honestly, this is not even specific to the wind application. But uh, one thing that has worked, a strategy that has worked for us is just working closely with the customer and uh, trying to solve their immediate concern with a quick solution and then iterating and improving on it through continuous feedback from the customer. Because this method of quick solution and iterations of improvement helps ensure we aren't spending too much time on perfecting a solution before getting direct feedback from the people with, who have the domain knowledge about this problem. Uh, and this works with both like external customers, whether we are providing solutions to them or when you're working with internal customers like our inspection analysis team. Um, another um, practice I can think of just closely related is um, solving focus problems that are necessarily providing business value um, and not losing um, yourself and just trying to do something cool. Uh, I mean, and I think that takes a form of defining the business metric that you're actually trying to optimize and uh, what a success criteria is for that by having all those, again, the relevant stakeholders in the loop. Um, so example, for if you're building a damage uh, identification system and if the team, the customers care, come, come to say that we really care about missing, not missing damages. So percentage misses becomes your key success metric and every other metric takes a little bit of a backseat. So when you're setting the goal, it comes that it's best set when it comes from stakeholders of, of the problem in the loop. So that's been my experience. Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, Dr. Traeger, we'll come back to you again now. Um, wh what's some of the recent uh, lessons that we've learned uh, in, in the recent shift to the use of robotics, so such as UAVs? One of the big lessons that we've learned is the opportunities exist for all this data. We don't know exactly how to use it. So um, before uh, the autonomous defect detection algorithms were there, we were getting petabytes of data, um, including flight pan, LIDAR, 3D imaging, and it was all wonderful information, but we didn't know how to do it. How do we assess this and getting people skilled up to deal with the data? So what needed to happen was a shift within the industry to be more de data savvy and data smart. Um, another thing that we learned is the offshore environment is extreme and it needs extra special consideration. So it sounds silly, but wind farms are put in windy places. Um, and a lot of the deployments, they cannot handle the gusts. And as you go higher and higher, once we get to those 150 higher hub heights and tip types, the conditions there are not the conditions at sea level or ground level. 
Another thing is just the saltwater corrosiveness um, and many of the deployments Scott Wind was mentioned are in the North Sea. So very cold environment. So things that work well in a test lab or onshore um, in a nice sunny climb do not work in extreme conditions. Um, and the last one is uh, folks get seasick. So currently, uh, even if it's autonomous, a pilot has to be there at the base of the turbine. And it's really hard to look at a really small thing up in the air. And so that's the human dynamic. How is the human using this? So the technology is great, but in practicality, how it works out for those who have to use it, it's a learning process, it's iterative. But um, yeah, I think the big thing is we need to shift the way that we think about data the way we use it and have those contingency plans. It's funny you mentioned that. I've also seen some uh, some drones being used by photographers that are have been programmed to come back to a specific geographical point offshore when the boat is no longer there and they end up in the water uh, unintentionally. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, Andrew McDonald, I'll come to you again. Um, what other sectors face similar challenges that you've seen or that uh, maybe OER, ORE Catapult has seen? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I'm a great fan of learning from learning from other people and seeing seeing what happens and applying it. And I think in in the areas of you know particularly around robotics and AI, um, there's a number where you know offshore wind is a and wind is a relatively young industry. So if we look at the nuclear sector, they're dealing with incredibly hazardous situations. They're using robotics a lot. They you know they're really understanding how to use those in a safe way and and they they kind of a regulation and control around that. I, I think there's a huge amount to, to learn from there. Another would be oil and gas. I think, you know, in terms of the subsea technologies, they're used to working in hazardous environments. They understand the, the benefits to safety and to cost reduction of, of using robotics where, where, it, where it can improve things. So I think we should be looking to, to colleagues in, in oil and gas. Um, I think there's, there's probably other other sectors, you know, which are growing particularly fast in terms of AI, a, you know, and even if it's if it's kind of fintech sectors or, or biosciences, I think there's things that we can learn there, and we shouldn't be scared to take uh, AI, which which ultimately is a tool set, and applying it from other sectors across to to offshore wind. Thanks for that. I've got a very angry dog in the background, so I'll try to I'll try to. Uh... Proceed. Dr. Kovacs, uh, this is a question from you coming from our audience. How are your robotics and AI testing during extreme weather situations? What should or what do you think should be done in education that is not there as we are now moving more towards AI and robotics? Great. Thank you. I think these are two questions, one about education and one about the wind itself. So the education, I think what is missing often is a view of integrating disciplines. So a lot of people take a dead robot body and put a controller on it, right? But this is not how, that's not optimal, right? It's about co-evolving the robot structures with the, with the controller as well together. So I think this uh, paradigm, I think, is important, uh, which means about, for example, having robots that are adaptive, that can change the morphology, that are metamorphic and have controllers on them, which allows them to do perching, underwater inspection, mobility, crawling, climbing, flying together by changing their body. And this type of new type of, this new type of robotics uh, needs to be uh, thought of in a multidisciplinary way. In terms of the wind itself, I think it's about uh, stabilization. So how can we fly robustly in wind? One thing that can help is stabilizing through perching or attaching to the structures but also using AI and machine learning to uh, evolve controllers that evolve in the wind, in a turbulence conditions. So we have shown that uh, we have a paper on that where we looked at the adaptive neural network where it changes the depth. So it forgets layers or learns layers in addition, not just the weights of the different nodes of a neural network in order to be able to fly in wind or off wind. So depending on the environment, the structure of your neural network, I think can also adapt. And this uh, can help as well in robust operation in wind. Thanks very much for that. Um, Andrew McDonald, this is another question from the, from the floor, um, which I was posed to you. It's in relation to floating platforms. Um, and can we, can we in the future 
guide a floating platform to uh, using AI as to where their their areas of more wind? Is that how floating technology works? Maybe you can just put a few words around it's, that and dispel a few bits. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a lovely idea. I think there's there's two <laughs> there's two challenges to that. One is that um, they they need to be secure and stable. They're they're very very large, you know. Um, hundreds, tons and tons um, in, in terms of, uh, so you need to secure them, they need to be safe. Um, and also, the, I, I don't think the wind moves so much that it would actually make sense to move them around. And also, you need to get the power off them. So you need, the, there needs to be a cable connected that's going to take the power back. So they, they're floating uh, platforms in the sense that they're a, easier to install. You can put them in different seabed conditions you can put them in deeper water so that's where your flexibility is you can tow them back to port for uh, operations and maintenance I, I don't foresee the situation where you'd actually move them around to to follow the wind um they, they, I, I mean it, it it sounds in some ways that that that, that I, I never like to dismiss ideas and for example we're looking at how we can use a floating wind platforms to uh, electrify oil and gas platforms and you can imagine a situation where a turbines are used for one a oil and gas site. When that oil and gas site is decommissioned, you would move the turbines to to another site. But that's over a period of years. That's not uh, in in the kind of chasing the wind kind of scenario. So so I think uh, the, these are large power stations. Effectively, is, is the way that we need to to think about them. And and I think there's some really smart AI about uh, on the Met Ocean side predicting the wind. Um, and, and as Elizabeth was talking about, the, the wind farm control and the whole wind farm control is, is probably where we'd see AI being applied. Yeah, th thanks for that. Having said that, I guess that uh, wind float one was actually towed and redeployed at King Cardine. So there are, you know, there, let, let's see. Let's, I mean, as you say, let's not be too dismissive of, uh, of what could come up in the future. Uh, look, thanks very much for that. Um, Dr. Traeger, uh, I think you mentioned the cybersecurity uh, in your presentation. And one of the questions from the floor is, has AI been applied to security monitoring to counter cybersecurity attacks? Yes, it has and it actively is. You can kind of think of the cybersecurity that looks for fraud on a credit card, that type of thing. So we're looking for um, odd change points or out of character events. Um, we look at uh, different volumes of traffic on the network um, in connection systems. And for those systems that are trying to deploy autonomous navigation, we're looking at could someone attack and have an adversarial network type algorithm replaced for a controller. So we are using AI actively to monitor traffic and changes, but we're also looking at cybersecurity attacks and trying to detect attacks using AI. So yes, it is. Thanks very much for that. Uh, I can see we have two minutes left of our allotted time. So maybe we should uh, wrap this session up now. And then uh, the, I know that the panelists will be joining the, uh, the network for a continued discussion uh, after this session. So uh, maybe if I can quickly just get a 30 second uh, rundown of, of final thoughts from each of the panelist members. So I'll start with you, Shweta Kushu. Uh, what's a 30 minute, 30, 30 minute, 30 second parting thoughts about, uh, for the, on, on your thoughts about AI and robotics in particular, maybe how you see them impacting on the SDGs? Yeah, thank you, Stuart. Um, as I had said in my presentation, um, again, wind is going to be at the forefront of moving towards lower carbon emissions and to get wind to scale up to be profitable it's, and easily accessible, AI and robotics is going to play a really important role in the entire, during the entire lifespan of uh, a wind turbine. Uh, I see a lot of potential in as I said, in O&M industry, but also all the way starting from installation, manufacturing, maintenance, data gathering and data centralization, standardization and all of that. Uh, and, and I see AI and robotics playing a very crucial part in making sure that it is optimized and it gets us to uh, where, what we want to achieve by 2050. Thanks very much. Uh, Andrew McDonald. Thanks, Joe. I mean, I think really just to, to reflect 
on the growth of the sector and the, the speed of the growth of the sector. And that's driven by it being the, the low costs coming in, the cost reductions that we've seen. It's also driven by the fact that it's a, it's a safe sector. Um, and I think both of those are things that will will drive it forward in terms of it being a solution for, for net zero. The, the one area I'd, I'd say point heaven towards is floating wind in terms of the move from fixed bottom platforms to floating platforms. I think that opens it up as a, as a global market and I, I think we'll continue to see huge global growth. So that would be the, the one thing I'd, I'd encourage people to watch the, the development of. Thanks very much. Professor Kovac. Well, I think one thought that I would like to, to add to this is that uh, future robots are going to be residential. So they will live on the plant. They will also not just use vision, they will also use touch to place sensors, to do coating inspection, insulation inspection, corrosion sampling, and eventually repair. So nature has done that already. So I think we can think in the same way and build an ecosystem of systems that will achieve that. And to do that, we need to work together. So it's really across the entire supply chain and all agents that are in the space uh, to team up and create this ecosystem for the future. Thanks. And the final word for Dr. Traeger. I think the final word is we're ready for it. We welcome it in industry and we will continue to cooperate and do what we can to make all of those visions a reality. Perfect. Well said. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank uh, each of our panelists. Uh, Mr. Andrew McDonald, Director of Offshore Wind and Development and Operations at ORE Catapult. Uh, Ms. Shweta Kushu, Engineering Manager from Computer Vision at Skyspecs. Dr. Elizabeth Traeger, Senior Research Senior Researcher on Digital Assurance at DNV, and Professor Michael uh, Kovac, Director of Aerial Robotics Laboratory at Imperial College of London. Uh, thank you very much for, to, for all of your participation today. And I'd like to thank the AI for Good Neural Network for organizing today's session. And I'll hand back to Gulen now to, uh, to wrap up the session. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. And a big thanks to our panelists, Mirko, Sueta, Elizabeth, and Andrew, as well as to the participants for making it such an interesting discussion. We had lots of great questions, and uh, we encourage you to check out the AI for Good program online to see more robotic sessions that may be of interest to you. For example, uh, on March the 3rd, we'll have a leading expert panel on Collaborative Robots, the Future of Human Robot in Collaboration with Professors Ot Villar, Danica Krajic, Julie Schall, and Brian Scasellati, and Ms. Roberta Nelson Chia. And on Thursday, the 17th March, we'll be discovering how robots are getting a human sense of touch. And finally, on March the 31st, we'll have a session on AI powered vehicles for humanitarian health deployment in partnership with the World Food Program. And this is the end of this section. And now it is time for networking in the neural network with the panelists and the participants for the next 30 minutes. See you all in a couple of minutes in the neural network. And I will give you the floor back to Anna for the closing information. Thank you a lot. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the satisfaction survey, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the 30-minute networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits and poster boards, and build your personalized AI for good program. It was a pleasure learning with you today. See you at the next AI for good.